So good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Harish Maringanti, and I work as Associate Dean for Research, Technology, and Digital Strategies at uh, University of Utah. And uh, I'm here to talk about challenges of stewardship of older but important scientific data and why it is important for research libraries to play a role in curating these data sets by using an example from my own institution. One of my co-presenters, uh, Matt Brunswick, he couldn't be here uh, today, so I'm the only presenter, but have a lot of collaborators. They all contributed to this presentation and uh, to the project. So just wanted to acknowledge their contributions here. And this is a brief roadmap of the presentation today. I'll talk about the history of the Patagonian Southern Right Whale Program and then talk through what's in the collection as we inherited it. And then the collaborations between the library and the research group and take a deep dive into the challenges of uh, curating this important data set. And then I'll give an update on where we are and what some of the lessons learned are. So it all started when uh, Dr. Roger Payne visited uh, Peninsula Valdez on the coast of Argentina to observe right whales. Roger Payne, as some of you may know, is an uh, American biologist and environmentalist famous for the 1967 discovery of Songs of the Humpback Whale, probably the most famous nature album in history. Vicky Roundtree joined the Right Whale program as a full-time researcher a couple of years later, and the program officially began under her in 1970. Now, two things were required to conduct this behavioral study of free-ranging populations of large mammals. First, they had to develop a method to recognize the individual whales and track them, which they did, and I'll talk more about how they did it uh, later in the session. Second, they had to find ways to extend the study over several years, which they also did. The program continues to this day and is the world's longest continuous study of a large whale species based on following the lives of known individuals. So why is this important? The core part of this pioneering research program was to develop the sighting histories. These sighting histories have been used to fit sophisticated population models and trends of an endangered species. They can est estimate a full set of demographic parameters for the southern right whales that carve at Peninsula Valdez in the coast of Argentina. These include the average age of first reproduction, the distribution of interbirth intervals, the population size, and its rate of yearly increases. For example, they found some evidence that right whale carving rates are correlated with climate variability. As the water temperature rises from the norm, calf output declines. For generations, the right whale was hunted for oil and delane. Today, about a third of right whale deaths are the results of collisions with ships and entanglements in fishing gear. Some scientists fear that right whales could become extinct within the next 200 years. To prevent that from happening, scientists are using a variety of innovating techniques to study, protect, and rescue right whales. As data accumulate each year, they show more and more clearly how the right whale population has continued to grow despite serious ecological challenges. Several student groups from Argentina are uh, currently involved in this project. So in addition to keeping the research project running, these young advocates represent their population at International Whaling Commission meetings and influence policy changes that will conserve whales and their marine habitats. This living body of research grows year to year and will continue to eliminate a wide variety of basic scientific and urgent practical issues such as the effects of climate change and increasing commercial boat traffic. So what's in the collection? Well, we have lots and lots of uh, black and white negatives, over 15,000 of them. 
color 35 millimeter slides around 70,000 uh, 70, and odd. Uh, analyses, notebooks, handwritten, field notes. These contain the sightings and behavioral data of the whales. We have Microsoft Access Database 2 from 1997. And sightings map. So this is a brief uh, snapshot of the uh, the numbers of the different data that we have. So the primary data are the thousands of photographs of the whales that were taken each year from a light plane as it flew along the 500 kilometer coastline of the peninsula. And the analysis notebooks that documented sightings, condition and behavior of the whales. Moving on to the collaboration. So what teams were involved? We had uh, several different teams. Um, Institute of Conservation from Argentina, which is a nonprofit that was set up in 1990s. Ocean Alliance, which is a US nonprofit set up by Roger Payne in 1970s. And then several different departments from within University of Utah. The library was involved along with the Division of Biology where Vicky Roundtree uh, has her primary appointment. The project evaluation funding and the workflows, how we went about it. Um, when Vicky moved to Utah, she found herself managing many filing cabinets filled with thousands and thousands of 35 mm film photos. At risk of fire or other disasters, the collection had limited access, especially for project partners and researchers from Argentina. It involved sharing Microsoft Access database file back and forth in an email uh, that can get corrupted. Um, they could not technically mail all the slides, so the researchers did not have access to the primary data. So Vicky had to spend a lot of time clarifying questions over email. Uh, so one of the things we did as part of our project evaluation and prioritization was to scope the digitization of the analog data. And we pitched it as part of uh, the digital rescue. So initially we got some seed funding from Office of Vice President for Research because they were interested in the research data management. And this was a different project uh, in the sense we had analog data that was historic and scientific in nature, and uh, it was also currently being added to. So this is still an ongoing research. So they showed interest and we got some funding to look at what's in the inventory, take an accurate assessment of the quality of materials, and uh, think about what it would take to digitize the whole set. Luckily, this led to subsequent funding from uh, CLER through their digitizing hidden collections program. And uh, thanks to them, we were able to digitize the whole collection. Now, moving on to the core of the presentation, which is the challenges of curating this data set. First, as, uh, as we uh, have seen, the variety of data and the data formats that we have um, again, just a quick summary of what all is in the collection. And uh, given that this project started in 1971, just imagine the type of technological evolutions it uh, witnessed over the life of its project. So the data capture methods change over time, uh, including the technical equipment. Um, for example, when it started in 1970, the researchers had to find a way to figure out where these right whales congregated. So the, uh, what they did with their annual photographic surveys was they, uh, they had uh, a light plane fly over different parts of the coast of Argentina taking these pictures. The, initially, it was in uh, 35 mm black and white film. 
and later with uh, assistance from National Geographic Society, they got uh, upgraded to color film. And then only after 2004, they started using digital cameras to take uh, high quality pictures. And now they use uh, drones as the primary method to photograph the whales. Uh, so the methods have changed quite a bit. Uh, here you would see the changes initially when it started out with taking some pictures from the land and then taking overhead shots of the photos. So we have to account for the corrections in angles and how that is captured in the uh, data descriptors in their access database. Um, the georeference, again, this is a very critical uh, thing for biodiversity and the ecosystems type of data. Um, with the data gathering initially, again, they figured out where the whales congregated in the, in the coast of Argentina near Golfo San Jose. And they also knew that southern right whales, that is the, the green um, color that you see is the range of the migration patterns for the southern right whales. They tend to stay below equator and it has to do with the rising temperatures at the equator too. Um, but initially, because they did not have digital equipment, they could not get accurate uh, collection of GPS coordinates. Going from 1970s to 1990, most of the sightings map were just estimates. So one of our GIS specialists worked with uh, Vicky in terms of narrowing down and creating a digital map with georeference data. And it's, again, it's mostly an estimate, it's not accurate, but after they moved to the digital cameras because the GPS coordinates are automatically logged and tracked, uh, they had accurate location data after 2004. So just imagine within the data set, you have varying degrees of accuracy too that we have to account for. Now the photo identification, even the methods of identifying individual whales, it changed over time. Uh, initially, they, before they could use AI, right, back in 70s, uh, or even uh, use any pattern matching algorithms, it was mostly a manual work. So they came up with a very clever technique and a practical way to identify individual right whales. Um, by relying on the natural markers, and these are called callosities, the patches of raised thickened epidermis on their heads that you see in this photograph. Some of the callosities are exposed every time a whale surfaces to blow. The number, position, and shape is unique to each whale. And although minor changes occur over time, the overall pattern remains identified uh, identifiable from birth and almost certainly throughout the life of the whale. So they used these uh, patterns to identify whales and give them unique IDs. And this is again another uh, slide that goes into how the whole process worked. And this is part of the database where they can fill up different characteristics and see if there is a record of such a whale already in the database. If it is, they know that this is the one. If not, they would create a new ID for the whale. So this was uh, the categorization method, as they called it, mostly manual. Later on, they moved on to a different technique by using the assistance of uh, machines at that point, compute uh, and data that they already had. Um, this was mostly a pixel level, uh, level pattern matching. Uh, they had to adjust for, again, angles and certain things. Uh, but it was semi-automated, so to say. And this algorithm was developed by Lex Hebe and Phil Lovell. They had uh, some research papers come out of this, too. And it was mainly used. Now, uh, there are experiments underway. Now, this is my obligatory AI. <laughs> mention for this project. Uh, as you can imagine, given this quality data and uh, 
um, and the images that are available, um, someone can come up with a deep learning algorithm. And there are experiments um, that were conducted in the last two years. And uh, yeah, it's easy to imagine that the next step would be using AI to develop the identification system, right? So the gist of this is it went through several different changes in the in the in the way the whales are identified too. Now, once a whale is identified, this is how the numbers were given, the unique numbers, and this is a a lovely story just to follow through. So this is the picture that you see is a calf that was named thirteen dash seventy one because it was initially identified in the year 1971, and it was born to the mother that was named 13. And why that was uh, named 13? Because they tend to give names based on the sequence in which they find, identify these whales, so that was the 13th whale identified in the database. So they have this unique naming convention and you need to know about this right before you can do something with the data. And uh, so they tracked, and this is how they tracked. So they found the first one in 1971. The whale was again re-identified in 84, 94 along with its own calves, and in 2008 and 2011. And you could also see the progression in the quality of the images too. Um, so again, the photo identification went through several iterations. Uh, the initial data has much more descriptors in the database uh, that we saw than the subsequent one it's once they started using the semi-automated uh, algorithms. What else? So these are the next, uh, the ones that we went through very quickly summarizing the context in which we work, especially with this uh, data set. But in addition to those, we had our own set of challenges in terms of how the library systems work and how we were trying to fit the scientific data and the metadata into the systems that we had because one of our goals was not to create a, a different portal for this unique collection. Our goal was to digitize the analog data so that we can do the digital rescue, and also try to use our existing access platforms to push out as much information as possible, rather than recreate a new metadata schema to fit this data. So we had lots of conversations with, uh, with our stakeholders, with the uh, researchers on this. And one of the key things we struggled with, but ultimately ended up going this way, is the point number two, which is, the sightings, uh, the database itself had the sightings centric approach, meaning they organized all their data and the metadata based on the year in which those photos were taken, right? In the library system, we were faced this, with this approach where most of the library systems are item focused, item level focused, right? Uh, again, I'm not talking about the finding aids and all that stuff, just the emphasis on the digital asset management systems. So we uh, we went through a couple of iterations in trying to extract the sighting-centric data and map it into a whale ID-centric data. And uh, that took some time, but ultimately we think we were successful in doing it uh, because that opened up a lot more uh, avenues for the researchers and their teams to interact with the data set in many different ways uh, because they were limited in terms of their approach uh, to working with the initial data set based on how it was organized. But given that we were able to put it in a whale ID centric data, it opened up multiple avenues. Um, and then one other thing that we found out was even though they had an access database, the data was not uh, organized in a relational way. It was mostly a log of sightings data, meaning the access database had like one table and all the data was just dumped in the table. Uh, so that was, uh, that was another challenge as we dove into the data, um, how these were done. Again, this is just a very brief, uh, 
example of what sort of techniques our developers had to come up with in terms of making sure that the whenever they took the slides and digitized them, there was a mapping between the slides and the file name and what the whale IDs were as part of the, the database. And as part of it, we found out several instances where there, uh, for example, as I mentioned, we had like 400,000 rows uh, once we exported the database access into the CSV file because it was a log of sightings data, meaning it, there was a potential for subsequent rows to contradict what might have been in the initial rows because the way the identification things worked, they had the photos taken and after they do their analysis several months later, they would start assigning IDs to the whales, right? So given how the project was set up, there were some instances where we had to work with the researcher to look at the accuracy of what was in the spreadsheet and make some corrections so the data was consistent. Um, so where, where is the project now? So we were successful in digitizing the entire collection. I jumped ahead, let me go back. Um, and uh, right now we are providing access via three different channels. We have all the digital objects um, made available through our digital asset management systems. And then we have an accompanying digital exhibit to capture the context of the project. And then we also are making the data available for computational use through our data repository. And I could give a demo later on, but um, the again, if you're familiar with the latest digital asset management systems, we have all the features built in. Um, they can zoom, they could look at the gallery view, uh, browse through different facets. So technically they can come up with their own set of queries. If they want to see if a whale appeared in 1971 and 78 and 85, there is a very quick way to drill down using the facets. And also if they want to see if a particular whale appeared with another companion whale, that data is also open, uh, just based on uh, the systems that we have. So why should libraries care? And what did we learn from, uh, from this project? So research libraries can play an important role in taking stewardship of important legacy data sets that may be lost over time. Now being an integral part of research institutions, libraries can provide the continuity needed to curate the data sets beyond the life of one individual researcher. Research libraries can do their part in bringing hidden legacy data sets into the open by actively collaborating with research scholars who can be assured that their data sets will not be misused and thus become enthusiastic partners in making data sets openly available for the future. And they can offer different perspectives too on data management that individual researchers perhaps may not think of. And this is very important so we can enable interdisciplinary work that uh, our keynote speaker, Dr. Dan Reed, uh, talked about in his keynote speech yesterday. Now, data management as part of the research environment with its ongoing commitment to support science, it is a bi-directional relationship, meaning in contrast to idealized models that frequently portray data curation as taking place after data collection and submission, have occurred, so, but that is not the way, and this is a good example of a project where you can get early on. I mean, 47 years is not early on, but, but according to the researcher, they want to see this project continue, right, for the next 50 or how many ever years. So we are right in the middle of the action here, helping the researchers understand the curational, curation aspects of, uh, of the data. Um, now, Many key biodiversity and ecosystem questions involve flux, meaning changes in range, numbers, distributions, genetics, and proportions over time, extinctions, migrations, incursions, um, 
impact all issues of flags. Now, seldom does one data set span enough time, area, or include enough species to answer a specific question by itself. Scientists often require that biodiversity and ecosystem data be assembled from different sources into time sequences of comparable data sets, realizing that the component data sets may have been compiled for a very different purpose to begin with. Again, this point was also mentioned in the keynote speech. So I think with that, I just leave with uh, this photo. Again, this helps with the tourism industry too. Here you see the whale identified by its number, 0889. The outside two photographs were taken in different years, 88 and 2011. And the middle one was taken from a, a whale watch ship uh, the, by photographer Stephen Johnson. So it promotes uh, more involvement from uh, citizens who are interested in this work and the tourism industry too. With that, I will, I think that's the last slide that I have. Happy to take care of questions. Yes. Are you familiar with the Happy Whale Citizen Science Project that's doing the same thing on an international scale? And have you talked to them or thought about integrating with their data set? Our um, project coordinator, I mean, the primary project lead, uh, Vicky Roundtree, uh, she did mention about some coordination. So the Southern Right Whale Program, the one that is mentioned in this project is uh, is on the coast of Argentina, right? There are similar right whale projects um, on the coast of uh, Africa and also Australia. So there were some discussions in the past about creating a common catalog and the questions about how the IDs, right, how different whales are named in each of these catalogs, how that would get mapped. Um, so I'm not up to date on the latest efforts on that front, but I would be happy to take that feedback and check. Uh, what did you say the name of the project was again? Happy Whale. Happy Whale. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, it's up to you. That's a great question. Um, so a few years ago, are you familiar with Wild Me? It's a nonprofit uh, that works with biodiversity data. Uh, they were interested in uh, developing something similar. Uh, so we don't have that functionality. We, it hasn't come up in the recent past, but that's a great, uh, great question. Um, and if you have suggestions, yeah, I would love to take some feedback and see how that could be done. Um, so that's captured in the field notes and um, the uh, uh, Microsoft Access database too with their own uh, notation. So they use mnemonics, they use different types of uh, uh, short forms to capture the data in the in their database. Now what happens with the algorithm that the pictures of the algorithm that I showed, there's a bit of manual work that goes behind. So the angle adjustment does not happen with the algorithm itself. So a human would adjust for the angle 
and look at what uh, what was captured in their field notes and only then they feed it to the algorithm. So the algorithm, all it does is once you have the angle matched, it does a pixel to pixel matching. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but in terms of the, and that's why there was a, so lots of this research group gets lots of uh, photos taken from the boats, right? They are at a different angle than ones where you capture the photos from the planes flying overhead. Most of the data that we have is from the planes that fly over the head. We don't have many photos from the uh, tourism side of things. And even if we do, I do not know if the researchers actually add them to the catalog, maybe because of, the, of that difficult question on how to adjust for the angle. Um, but there is, there's a Kaggle data set that was released a couple of years ago and someone was looking at doing that work, um, if you are interested in pursuing that further. Are, are you talking about the, when you say application, the... the grant application. Oh, grant application. We, 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 I, right now we don't have it in the data set, uh, but because some of the researchers and uh, partners are from Argentina, they, they have some, uh, some field notes they have some original data that's not yet part of this collection, okay? This collection goes up to 2004 because again, the original scope was to do a digital rescue. So whatever is already in a digital format, we have left it out of the scope of the grant funded project. So what was mentioned in the grant, right? Um, but we are hoping to release a, a different, uh, different version of our exhibit later by working with the partners in Argentina. So right now, I mean, in summary, we don't have any other language data yet in the database, in our uh, data set, but we are hoping that as we finish this project and continue further developments, we would be able to get more in. Thank you for funding the project too. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Yeah, so I have a question. Um, you were describing that one of the opportunities you can do through your access to this data is see maybe two whales that are coming together at some point or whatever. I'm wondering if it has more multidimensional potential to allow for, say, a family or social group to be followed and kind of tracked to start understanding um, you know, whale behavior. No, excellent point, and uh, I wish my research uh, guru was here, right, Vicky? She probably would answer this. Um, but yeah, I mean, no, that's an amazing question. I should probably take it back and see if uh, that, if they are doing that already, or if not, if the way this portal functions, if that would enable that functionality that you talked about. Okay, I think we are probably beyond the time. Thank you so much for your patience and uh, coming here. Yeah.